Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm very excited to be coming to Florida Tech in the fall and uh, excited to talk about uh, some planets tonight. Uh, some of you who may have been to some of the past lectures, this has come up a few times in the last uh, several lectures, um, but hopefully I will add some uh, new and interesting insights. Um, and the exciting thing about this field is that it is changing almost every day. Uh, there are new big discoveries, and so even since uh, a few weeks ago when you heard the last talk on this, uh, there are some actually some big uh, news reports that I'll be uh, updating everyone on, hopefully. Um, so uh, also, as, as I'm going along, uh, feel free to ask any questions and interrupt me. I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to field any questions at any point as we're going along. Um, so I, I'm currently at the University of Florida, a postdoc there, and I'll be presenting work really of the entire Kepler team. Uh, so Kepler is the space mission, the space telescope, as was mentioned, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, but there's, there's a large team of people, a large group of people. Um, there's sort of, sort of me, well, I guess I'm not necessarily at the top. I'm kind of maybe in the, in the middle. I'm not sure where to put me, but, um, but, but there's, there's me. There are many other scientists. And then supporting the scientists are many engineers and many, uh, and, and, and many people who proposed the mission decades ago, literally, and waited for NASA to finally in the technology to be developed so that it could actually be launched and sent up. And of course the taxpayers are supporting all of that uh, uh, um, endeavor. So it's, it's a very large group of people, a very interesting uh, collaborative effort um, and uh, very exciting. And what I want to talk to you specifically about tonight in terms of the title is that um, Kepler sort of very quietly discovered an entirely new kind of planetary system. And it actually may be the kind of planetary system, meaning that most stars have this kind of planetary system and not something like our own planetary system. And so, and then this will actually have uh, implications for uh, planets that might be able to uh, support life, and we'll talk about that as we go along. Here are some of the people that are involved uh, with uh, the work that I've been doing. My previous advisor at the Center for Astrophysics, Matt Holman, Jack Lissauer as at NASA Ames. Jason Rowe is also at NASA Ames. He's really important. He finds all the planets. So we, we like Jason, uh, he, he takes care of it. Well, so, so he, he finds, he is supported by a large team of people who, he's sort of the, the, the gateway for the planets, so we like Jason. Uh, Dan Fabricki is a colleague of mine who's just starting at UU Chicago. My advisor at the University of Florida right now is Eric Ford, and then Jason Steffen, who's currently at Northwestern. And I'll also be presenting a little bit of work from a couple of my students, Joshua Brackenseek and Ethan Cruzy. Um, so, um, Extrasolar planets are planets around other stars. They are, we are just now reaching the regime where we can look out into space and study stars with various techniques and infer the presence of planets around those stars. This has only been possible for about the past 15, 20 years. Um, it is a very young field as far as astronomy goes. Um, but every 10 years, the astronomy community gets together and says, Okay, these are the kinds of things we're working on. What are we going to do? What are the big goals for the next 10 years? And this uh, happened a few years ago, and it's called the Decadal Survey. And even though exoplanets has hardly been around for 10 years, it was one of the highest priority uh, aspects of astrophysics uh, in the Decadal Survey. So what we're talking about here is a prominent part of the current uh, astronomy and astrophysics research of all kinds. Um, and, uh, and it is very exciting. Um, there are many ways for detecting and characterizing uh, planets around other stars, and they have different strengths and weaknesses. And I won't be going into all the different methods. I will be talking primarily about one method that, uh, that is most important for our purposes tonight. Um, but there, there are other methods uh, that are involved, and we are trying to piece together through all these different methods uh, what is going on and what other planetary systems are like and, and, what, uh, and how that relates to our own solar system. Um, and one of the main interests in this field is that understanding planets around other stars is a critical first step to understanding astrobiology, the idea that perhaps there is life out there. If there is, where is it? Well, to have life, one of the, un our understanding of the way biology works, for life to evolve, what you probably need is liquid water and the solid surface. The liquid water gets the molecules that are going to become bio biological molecules able to move around freely. It's a perfect solvent. All the molecules can move around. And the solid surface helps to concentrate those molecules into one place. If you just go out somewhere random in the galaxy and there's no stars, no planets, then the molecules are so far apart they barely even hit each other, ever. 
But if you take a look at what is happening inside your cells, it's millions of molecules all working together very quickly in a very coordinated way. For that to happen, we've got to get all the molecules together into one place. A liquid water on a solid surface is the, basically the only way, in terms of all of astrophysics, everywhere we could think of possibly life happening, that seems to be a really uh, critical regime. Uh, it's also critical in terms of the temperature. These chemical reactions that, that are interesting for forming complicated chemical reactions, you could think of sim sup very simple life as very complicated chemistry, there's only a very narrow range of temperatures where this is possible. And really, all of the science are, are pointing to what you really want is liquid water and a solid surface. And so that means planets. That, that means the planets are going to be where life is found in all of the universe. They're not going to be in white dwarfs. They're not going to be in black holes. They're going to be on planets. And so we want to understand these planets because they are sort of the critical first step in astrobiology. And this is partly biased by the fact that we happen to live on a planet. It's a nice place, we like it, and we don't want to go anywhere else and live there, um, at least without uh, spacesuits on. Um, but, uh, but really, there is, uh, there is a uh, chemical and biological explanation for why planets are so important. Um, so here, to give you an idea of some of the planets, here's Earth, here's Jupiter in sort of a false color image. Here's one of the planets that has been found around another star, one of the biggest ones called Trace 4. Um, and you can see that we are finding very large planets. Um, we will also be talking about very small planets as we go along tonight. Um, so I study in the interactions, the gravitational interactions between planets. If there's just one star and one planet, a, a few hundred years ago they figured out all of the physics that you could do with one star and one planet. They go around each other in ellipses, and that's it. Okay, nothing happens forever. That's actually not entirely true, but, 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 but for the most part, that's all that happens. Not very interesting to a physicist, um, but also um, doesn't give us much information. And so what we would rather have is a system of planets, multiple planets, all going around the same star. And so we call these exoplanetary systems when there's multiple planets going around. Sometimes I just call them multis for short. But the, the reason why we need multiple planets in a system is that each planet gives us a new piece of information, and all the planets working together give you a synergy of information that really is the critical underpinning for how planets form and evolve. If we, didn't, if we only saw individual isolated planets, Almost no matter how many we saw, it would be really hard to piece things together that we can learn instantly by looking at a planetary system. For example, in our own planetary system, we see that the planet's orbits are all in very similar uh, orientations. There's very little tilt between all the orbits. That instantly gives us information about how the planets formed. They probably formed in a disk, a pancake-shaped structure, and they're not just all flying around. And that tells us about what the kinds of conditions were uh, in planet formation, and so on and so forth. We really want planetary systems. And uh, there are many things that you can do once you have multiple planets. You can use the th theory behind how gravity works to understand how these planets formed, how they interact currently, to get estimates of how much they must, uh, how much they must weigh, how their, what their masses are, uh, and so forth. So we really like planetary systems. Um, on the other hand, there's a certain kind of detection technique um, that, that is really uh, valuable. Um, the most valuable, and it is called planetary transits, and this is when the planets pass in front of the parent stars. So in this animation that is not working, you can see that this planet is moving in front of its star, and as it moves along, I'm measuring the brightness of the star as a function of time. And when the planet is dark, you know, it's not emitting its own light, it's one of the basic uh, one of the basic properties of planets as opposed to stars. Star is emitting its own light and the planet is not. So when the planet passes in front, the star appears to get dimmer because less of the starlight is getting through. Now this is absolutely critical method for understanding planets because when this happens, you measure the radius of the planet, how big it is, the diameter, the size, uh, any of those, those are all interchangeable basically. And that is a huge piece of information and one of the reasons is a huge piece of information is because if, then if you have the mass of the object from, say, another technique, this method does not tell you how big the planet, how massive the planet is, how much material there is. It only tells you how large it is. But if you had both of those pieces of information together, then you would have the density of the planet. And you would have some idea, is it made of, is it a giant rock? Is it a giant puffball? Is it a giant water world? 
Um, and then that gives you information on how it formed and how it got to where it's currently at. And certainly whether we would want to live there. I just told you, you need a solid surface with liquid water. If it's a gas giant like Jupiter, no matter what temperature it is, it's really not habitable. We need to understand what it's made out of to get some sense of this. Now, the fact that this is the only way to measure a planetary radius is a big deal. My advisor at Caltech, his Twitter handle is Pluto Killer. Mike Brown, the Pluto killer. And uh, you may remember or know that Pluto is no longer a planet. It has been demoted to dwarf planet. Why? What happened? Well, it's not all Mike's fault, really. The real problem is when it was discovered back in 1930 um, by an amazing effort by Clyde Tombaugh, by the way, um, all you can see in astronomy, for the most part, until almost ever, in very few cases is this not true, all you see is a point of light. You do not know how big the object is. And so when they looked at Pluto, ooh, it was really bright. And so it could either be really small but very shiny, or it could be big and about the same sort of reflective properties as, you know, this table or charcoal or comets. Comets were known to not be small and shiny but to be for the for a constant amount of light, since all the light is reflected light from the sun, it could be either be really small and shiny or big and really dull, not reflective. And so people said, well, comets are not reflective, so this object must be huge, planet size, big, bigger than the Earth maybe. It's not impossible given the brightness of Pluto. But turns out, decades later, it's not big and dull, it's small and shiny. All of this information came from understanding the radius of Pluto, the actual size of Pluto. And that gave us information on how, Pluto, how massive Pluto must be. And since Pluto was not very was small and shiny, it couldn't be that massive, and no longer is it important in a planetary system scale of things, or at least not as important as it was 70 years ago. So it gets demoted to dwarf planet. We really want to know the radius. Of these planets. It gives us a huge amount of information and the only way to learn that by looking at it, taking a picture, measuring how fast it moves the star, none of that tells you the size. The only way is to see it pass in front of the star. So this is a unique, a critical piece of information that is uniquely gathered from transiting planets. And so we built an entire space telescope dedicated to doing just this, just looking for little dips in starlight called the Kepler Space Telescope. It has a simultaneous and continuous photometric observations. Photometric means brightness measurements of about 160,000 stars at a time. Over the course of its mission, it's observed about 200,000 stars, not all the whole time. Um, and it's extremely precise. PPM here is parts per million. So it can measure a dip of just two, 20 times 10 to the minus 6, just 20 parts per million, just the smallest little dip in brightness uh, around a typical star. And that is the, that is the dip that you need to, de to detect a planet the size of Earth. Because Earth is really small relative to the sun, so it only blocks out a little bit of starlight. So this is about the precision you need, and that's the precision it was built to get. And that's the precision it is getting. And so Kepler uh, was built to do this, and it does it very well. It's also observing constantly, right? If, uh, if I have an Earth going around a sun, it's only going to cause these little blinks once every year. It'll, it'll blink out, and then I'll have to wait the whole year for the planet to go all the way back around, and then for it to blink out again. So I can't take my eyes off of the Kepler field. This is, this is what it looks like, the stars. It's in a region of the sky near the Cygnus, the Squan. And, um, and it's constantly staring at this exact field. It has not changed for the last, uh, I guess we're now up to, f uh, I, I can't keep track of how many uh, quarters of data we now have. We almost have four and a half years of data now. Uh, and uh, it's planned for at least another few years, and we actually are currently working on trying to convince NASA to extend it even past that if it, if it continues working well. And so it's a very exciting uh, mission, able to d learn a lot of things from it. Um, but it works through this transit method. It's trying to find planets by looking for this, these dips in brightness. Here's what it has found as of earlier this year. Um, and this is actually with only about half of the data that we have currently. And so I know this is being recorded and going onto YouTube, but uh, I will tell you something that is not surprising, but exciting. Um, we already know that there are many, many, many more planets, uh, candidates than are seen here in the data. We're just in the very early stages of processing a much larger chunk of data, 
and you know are certainly finding many more planets. So this is this is you know an early chart, right? This chart will continue to fill in. And let's, let's sorry, I should have explained the chart. Here on the x-axis is the orbital period in days. How long it takes? Oops, sorry. How long it takes for the planet to go all the way around? Uh, in, in measured in days. And on the y-axis is the radius relative to Earth. And the funny scales is because these are both on logarithmic scales. And so here is an Earth-sized planet here. And here is where our orbital period is, 365 days. This is where Earth would be. And you can see that we're not there yet. Uh, and what happens is Kepler, as it gets more data, it gets better this way, in this direction. And so as we get more data, we will fill in this part of the plot, this regime. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's actually different planets with much higher periods. Yeah, you know, that's, you can't know. That's a, that's a great question. Do you mind if I come back to that a little bit later? I, 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 will, I will address this question in just a, a little bit. It's a good question. Um, so th there is this question, but hopefully, you know, supposing we can, it turns out we can figure out usually which, what's going on. Um, and, uh, and, and when we do that, we, we find these. Now, these are actually not technically planets. These are candidates which means that they, the light curve looks good, but it could be something that's not a planet. And I won't go into that in much detail, but probably 90% of these, 80, 90% of these are real. Uh, but there's some 10% that maybe aren't, uh, aren't as good. Um, and you can see that there is a huge number of planets here with periods of about 10-ish days and sizes of about a few times the size of Earth. Uh, and we'll come back to that as well. So very exciting, many, many planets, and this is continuing to grow um, as, as we process more and more data. Um, so with the Kepler mission being so good and finding all these systems, we would want to combine the two things I said were really valuable. We would like to have a system of transit, we would like to have transiting planets because then we get these radii and we understand the properties of the object and its density, we can understand its density, its atmosphere, what it's, what it's like on the inside. There's all sorts of things you can learn from transiting planets, so we'd want that. But then we also want systems of multiple planets. And so we can figure out how are these planets spaced? Are they all close in? Are, do, are they close to one another? Are they spaced far apart? And then can we use what we understand about the theory of gravitational interactions to study and understand the system of planets as a whole? All very exciting. For that, I need both of these. And if I have both, I actually have the most information-rich exoplanetary system that you can imagine. Right? If I want to understand how planets form, what planets are like, the properties of planetary systems, I want systems of multiple transiting planets, period. That's it. These are the most valuable. So hopefully, some of those Kepler planets that I showed you maybe fall into that category. But before we, talk about, um, before we talk about Kepler, this is how many multiple transiting systems we had before Kepler. Zero. Nothing. None. We had no, all we, we had transiting planets, but they were all loners. They were all single transiting planets. And we had systems that were discovered through other techniques, but they were not transiting. And so we couldn't use this powerful synergy. Well, let's see what Kepler was able to do. Here are the multi-transiting systems from Kepler. Now, this is a kind of a formal talk. I will not do cartwheels, but that is how I feel about these systems. This data set is extremely rich. This is an amazing insight into planetary systems. This is going to be the central work of dozens of PhD theses over the next couple decades. I'm not exaggerating. There are hundreds of scientific papers waiting to be exploited in this data set. It is extremely exciting. Most of the, many of the most interesting papers that Kepler has already come out with deal with these systems specifically, either all together or individual examples from them. It's a very, very exciting time. I call these systems exoplanetary gold because this is it. This is the most valuable type of system that we have, and Kepler has given us a huge number of these systems. Um, the other thing about these systems that it turns out, remember I said the, that we're not sure if all, those, if all those little dots, if all those possible planets are actually real planets. 
Well, it turns out that in an exoplanetary system, it's really hard to fake multiple planets doing this thing with any other signal. So, so I said 90%, 80%, 90% of the other ones are real. We know that 98 to 99% of these are real. So these are, these are real planets. We, we know that they're there. Now, so the, the question came up, how do I know, how can I disentangle, if I've got a transit here and a transit here, how do I know if it's not just two planets doing the same thing? And what usually happens is we have to wait long enough. So for example, here's, here's a system, KY191. This is a nice system. Um, it's got this little uh, 0.7 day planet, a couple day planet, uh, 10, and actually this is, is, turns out was in the wrong spot. It's actually over here at 40. Um, but for example, you could see that this planet is going to make a much bigger dip than these planets. And so you can tell from the size of the dip. You can also tell from how long the dip is. The further out the planet is, the longer, the slower it goes because the star's gravity is not pulling it as much. So it takes a longer time to cross in front of the star. So it turns out very rarely are we confused. Usually you're able to look and say, okay, this one has to go there, this one has to go there, and it all falls together really well. Okay? So very exciting, uh, extremely exciting uh, results from Kepler. And when I say we've only scratched the surface, uh, really, we just have just barely got this data. We're really just barely starting to analyze it. And there is a huge amount uh, of scientific research that will be coming out of these for the next couple decades. This will be the, the main data set. Our observing position versus the plane that the planets are in? Great question. One of the tricks with transiting planetary systems is that not every planet out there will transit. In fact, most of them won't because they have to be lined up so that the planet passes in front of them. Right? If I'm some random planetary system, if I'm the star and my hand is the planet and you guys are the observers, it could have been going like this, right? And you would not see any, you would not see any transits. Only when it's just exactly right on do you see the planetary transits. So that's one aspect. But then these make it even trickier, right? Because now I have multiple planets. Maybe they're, til maybe they're very tilted with respect to one another. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're all exactly flat. Maybe they're not. And if so, maybe I'm missing planets in between. Maybe we could do this. It turns out that is tricky, but that's actually my area of research exactly, is figuring this out, de untrickifying this effect. And when you untrickify this, um, you actually, it helps you, the fact that they have, to be so they have to be so perfectly lined up, because it means that you can discriminate very precisely between a system being f perfectly flat and even just a little bit different from flat would give you different, different combinations of these different things. And so we were able to do that to learn about these planetary systems, and I'll tell you the answer, what we found uh, in a couple slides, I think. Um, so yeah, so very exciting. Uh, and then let's, let's see what, what we can learn from these, these systems. So, so some of the sort of Kepler big picture results, the thing to remember about Kepler is that Kepler is a statistical mission. Its goal is to understand planets in general, planetary systems in general. Individual systems that it finds can be interesting and will be studied and, 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 and that sort of thing. But the real, the goal of it is to say, we're going to look at a whole large number of stars so that we can figure out what's going on on average in the galaxy and, and extrapolate that to the rest of, of the sky that we're not observing. And, and really, that, and that, that's, and so the whole idea is to get the frequency and the properties of different populations of planetary systems. Not necessarily to find planets themselves. The individual planets we find are interesting. But the goal is to, is to say, we found this many planets, and this is what that means in terms of how often planets form, and how many planets are out there, and what most of those planets are like, and so on. All right, so here's some examples of planetary systems that, that, that Kepler has found that we know about. One is hot Jupiters. These were known before Kepler. In fact, these were the transiting planets um, that were known before Kepler. Remember the loners that had been discovered? Um, they're called hot Jupiters. And Kepler, some research that Jason Stefan and I did showed, Kepler showed definitively that these planets are indeed loners. There are no other planets nearby. Uh, and that is one of the reasons, but these were the ones that were easy to find before Kepler. That's why before Kepler, there were no multi-transiting systems. Because Kepler, because before Kepler, this was all we could see, and it turns out these are just loner planets. They're, they're all alone, hot Jupiters, uh, for at least in their little region of space. 
there are now known planets, transiting planets around binary stars. Two stars going around each other and then a planet going around the two stars. And the planet goes in front of one or both of those stars and you see two dips uh, from the stars. Very interesting, very exciting. I'll show you a plot about that in a little bit. Um, then there's a set of systems called, that I call STIPS, systems with tightly packed inner planets. And I'll show you what, what I mean by that in a little bit. And then what I'm really interested in is inner solar system analogs. Eventually Kepler will be sensitive enough and have enough data that we can start and look and say, well, if our solar system were very common, we should have seen this many transiting, multi-transiting systems that look kind of like our solar system. How many did we see? And that will tell us, oh yes, our solar system is very common. The type of architecture we have in our solar system. Earth-sized planets kind of spaced out, you know, uh, at, you know, at the distances that we see. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not strict threshold, well, I'll, but I'll show you, but the, one of them? Huh? The one of them? Uh, no, our solar system is not tightly packed. I'll, I'll show you that in a little bit. I wanted to show you just real quick, just one slide on circumbinary planets. Here's, here's what they are, two stars going around each other. So actually they both, you could say they both, they both go around each other. And so you could say they both are going around the center of mass, which is this little square. So if they both have equal masses, they actually both kind of go around in a, in a circle. And then the planet passing in front, um, these are a few of the early ones. We actually now have, um, oh, I think this is secret too. Maybe I won't tell the, the secret. If we weren't being recorded, I'd tell you. Um, well, there, there is a planetary system with two, a circumbinary planet system with two known transiting planets and a third suspected planet. So two stars, probably three planets going around them. All, you know, one transiting and the other not transiting and very interesting. And it's also very interesting to think about the geometry. Well, wow, how did those all have to be lined up so perfectly to get it? At least it's interesting to me. That's, that's what I do. So, um, so, so, so I think it's interesting. Ooh, how do I get them all lined up just right? What does that mean in terms of how frequent they are? Um, so uh, these were first postulated in the 70s uh, when uh, Luke Skywalker um, had a double sunset. But there are planets just like this that have double sunsets, uh, that have two stars uh, that, they, that they are orbiting. They don't have to be hot planets, but they can be hot planets. Um, and the interesting thing about circumbinary planets that uh, some of my research has shown is that once you, so if you, know, if you have these two stars going around, the two stars are really heavy. So if I put a planet right up next to them, it's just gonna get kicked out of the system too close. But if, after you move out of that regime where you know, you're just gonna get kicked out, and you move out into where planets are stable, in stable orbits around these, the frequency of planets around binaries is basically the same as the frequency of planets around single stars. It doesn't seem to matter what's in the middle. And that is, I can tell you right now, that is really, really confusing to planet formation theorists who say, man, I can't do any, I, I try to form planets in a binary system, I can't do anything the binary, the stars to shake up the whole, so I mean there's a region where nothing works, but then even well in, uh, in the region where the orbits are stable, they're all shook up. And when orbits are shook up, the planet, the pieces of planets, the asteroids that are gonna come together and form planets, well to do that they have to hit so, so, so gently, sub-meter per second, really like two giant kilometer size objects have to hit at a speed slower than I'm walking or else they'll bounce or crash or nothing will happen. And when you shake up the whole disk, nowhere in the disk can you get these things to stick together. And yet we see planets there. We see planets there as frequently as we do around single stars, maybe even more frequently. So this is a bit of a conundrum. This has just come up. You know, I, I'm, I'm coming out saying, look, these are common and the planet formation theorists are coming out with papers at the same time saying we can't do it. Um, so we, we, we can't do one, and you're saying that there, that there are millions of these. Um, so, so something, something we're uh, uh, actively researching. Um, all right, now, uh, now I'd like to go to, to uh, really the, the main focus of this talk, which is um, systems with tightly packed inner planets. And it wouldn't be a fun Kepler talk without this animation from my colleague Dan Faberke, if it'll come up here. Looks like it's having a bit of a hard time. Oh. Mm 
Hmm. There we go. All right. Oh, it, it was worth a few seconds to see all these planets going around. Uh, so these, these are what I call systems with tightly packed inner planets. And they're fun, all the planets are moving around. Uh, some of these systems have multiple planets. Well, all these have systems that have multiple planets. They all at least have two. Uh, some have up to five, and one has six. Here's six here, Kepler 11. Um, six transiting planets. Um, and and maybe, maybe a planet in the gap here that's not transiting. We don't know. Um, and you can see the, and the different colors tell you what planet number they are. If you get up to cyan, you have four planets. Uh, green means you have three. Dark blue means you have five. Lots of planetary systems. This is just a different way of showing that same uh, plot that I showed you earlier. I should probably stop this before I uh, go back to this here. All right, why do I call these systems with tightly packed inner planets? No, 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 that was sped up. That was sped up. But it was, uh, it was uh, sped up in the same way for every system. So they were all synchronous in that sense. Um, so, the, uh, so why do I call these tightly packed inner planets? Well, because the Earth's orbit is this big. And to think about how many of these guys I can fit inside of there. Right? So these are all tightly packed. Maybe some of these down here are not that different from the Earth's orbit. Um, but most of these have periods of tens of days. Mercury's period in our solar system is a period of 88 days. So most of these systems fit entirely within inside Mercury's orbit. These are planets, these are planetary systems that we have never heard of before, never conceived of before, really. Um, and here's, a, here's an example of how tightly packed they are. This is one of my babies, KY500. I've been studying it for a little while. It has five planets. They're all, you can see they're all nicely lined up here. Uh, here are the planet sizes. Uh, here are the planets in this diagram. The planets are blown up by a factor of 25 or so. Um, and here, here they are uh, much larger for you to see. Well, so how big is Earth relative to these? Here's the size of Earth. So you can see even the smallest ones, a little bit bigger than Earth. We've got, you know, one and a half, one and a half, two and a half, two and a half times the Earth. The other thing to keep in mind is inside our own solar system, after the Earth in size, the next size up is Neptune, which is four times the size of Earth. So these planets of this size do not exist in our solar system. And so we really aren't entirely sure what to do with them. We're not sure what they're made of. Uh, we're, we're trying to learn uh, this at this time, and I'll talk about that in a second. Here's the Earth. Let me show you the Earth's orbit to scale on this plot. It's, you know, pretty big, right? So this entire system, this planet, outer planet, orbits at one twelfth of the distance that the Earth does. I, the area covered here is less than a 150th of the area of the Earth's orbit. And I've got five planets, all of them bigger than Earth, all packed into this small space. Now this is an extreme example, but this is what I mean by tightly packed. How can you tell what the radius of the planet to the radius of the planet's atmosphere is? Uh, I don't know anything about the atmospheres of these planets. So these could be fairly small planets with huge atmospheres. Yes, exactly. They could be, they could be little tiny rocks with big atmospheres. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, that's, a great, that's a great point that I do want. Actually, uh, well, well let, me, let me go ahead and, and get this point in. Um, now we're going to talk uh, just briefly, just kind of dip your toe into this idea of what we can do when we try to understand the gravity, the gravitational interactions between these planets. I told you before that a few hundred years ago we figured out that if you have just a star and a planet, the planet goes around the star and that's it. Nothing happens forever. And not only that, but you can solve the equations and show, and you can see in the solar system, you know, that if you have just one planet going around the star, it's like clockwork. It is perfectly periodic, on time, every time you can set your watch to it, for sure. If there are multiple planets, then you can imagine, well, I've got this one planet going around, and I've got another planet going around. And the planets do have some gravity between them. It's really weak, because the planets are much smaller than the star, but there is some gravity. Right? So here, here comes a planet along, and then here comes another planet along, and it starts to pull this planet back a little bit so that it transits a little bit late. And then the next time it's coming around, maybe the, the second planet is pulling it this way and the planet comes a little bit early. Well, we can detect this. So here on this plot, these are two planets from that system, the outer two, the big two planets. And here this line at zero, if they were always perfectly on time, these black data points would all lie along a line here on zero. 
But sometimes you can see they're late, and sometimes they're early, and then sometimes they're late, and then early in a, in a, in a periodic fashion. And in fact, you can see that when this planet is late, this planet is early. And vice versa, when this planet is late, this planet is early. And it works perfectly because what's happening is basically energy is being exchanged between the planets. And so when one's going a little bit faster, the other one's going a little bit slower, and then they switch. Very, uh, dynamically speaking, this isn't that much harder than just the one planet going around, uh, but it is very interesting because it has information in it. One information is that, how massive the planets are. Because if they were, if they were 10 times more massive, then the signal would be 10 times bigger. I would, be much, much, I would be 200 minutes late instead of 20 minutes late. And so all of a sudden, in the Kepler data itself, encoded in the data of these multi-transiting systems, is the masses of the planets, because you can understand the physics of the gravitational interaction. And that's very exciting for, for us, and so we're really working on this. And we have several measurements so far. So let me show you what we've got. This is actually an old slide, so we've actually had more than this. Um, this is the mass of the planet on the x-axis in Earth masses, the radius of the planet on the y-axis in Earth radii. And I didn't make this plot, I don't know why 0.5, but that's the way the plot is. Uh, it's not really important. Here are several points. We have, we have a few more points on this plot now. And Kepler over the course, and hopefully I'll be helping with the transit timing variations group, and we'll maybe be able to get dozens, maybe 100 points on this plot eventually. Many of them will have pretty big error bars. Some of them will have really small error bars. Um, we have some that have really tiny error bars. The whole, the whole data set fits in a really small region. Um, so what can we learn from this? Well, I told you if we had the mass and the radius, then we could understand what it was made out of. If it was made out of pure iron, it would follow this purple curve. Pure iron, if, as you add mass, grows in size in a certain way based on how iron you know, acts and how when it's under pressure at the center of the planet, what happens to it? And these things are, are moderately well known. Some of the physics is not entirely known, but it's pretty good. This red line corresponds if it was just a big, everything was just rock, pure rock, how a planet would grow in size as it grew in mass. The blue line is pure water. And above the blue line, if you're above the blue line, you have to have some component of gas, of atmosphere, specifically hydrogen and helium. You can't just be, if you're up here, you are too big to be, to be solid or liquid of anything else other than gas like in the gas giants, hydrogen and helium, the same gas that's in the sun, the most common uh, elements in the universe. So up here we can see, and this is I put on here where I think these planets will fall when I finish the analysis. There are a set of planets up here. These are close-in planets <clears throat> that are definitely above this water line, meaning they must have some component of gas. And that tells us a lot about them. In particular, it tells us that they had to form early on in the, solar s in the planetary system when there was still gas around because the gas doesn't last for very long, only a few million years and all that gas is gone. If they formed after that, they would not be this big. They would not be this puffy. So that's really interesting. That gives us a huge piece of information on how the planets formed. Um, and then down in here, you know, we have some planets that are kind of rocky, some that are maybe even close to iron. Um, these lines in between are sort of in between mixtures. Now, but what I want, uh, uh, the, the sad news, uh, the really sad news, is that even if I had a perfect point on this plot, and I knew its mass and radius really just exactly, and we have a few planets that where that's the case, I still can't tell you what it's made out of. It could be a little rock with a big puffy atmosphere. It could be a ball of iron with some water on top and then a little atmosphere. It could be, uh, you know, it doesn't, there, there are a variety of possibilities. <clears throat> now, the, ho the hope, and I would say right now it's a hope, it's not proven, the hope is that when we get a lot of points on this plot, and we, we understand, and some of these points are in multiple transiting systems. Here's Kepler 11b, Kepler 11f, and Kepler 11c and d aren't even on this plot. They're up, they're up here. We know about them as well. When we get a lot of points on this plot, and we understand a lot of systems, and we start to understand more about these how these planetary systems form, hopefully the idea is that we'll be able to get some more information than we could get from any single data point alone. Now, so far, mostly what we see 
is what you can kind of see this plot here. So remember with Kepler, with that, when I don't have these early late things, all I measure is the size. So for example, let's say I measure a size of two Earth radii. Well, you can see already I have a huge range of things that are already known that span from a few Earth masses all the way up to 15, you know, 12 Earth masses, ranging in compositions from gaseous to water rich to rock rich to you know, even getting into where we need some iron. So, this all, so, so what we see right now is unfortunately, knowing the size tells me very little about what the planet is made out of. Almost nothing about what the planet is made out of. We're hoping that we'll be able to learn to, to dig deep, once we get a lot more data, to dig deep in this and understand better what a planet is made out of. So when someone shows you, I have this Kepler planet, ooh, doesn't it look like nice to set up your lawn chair on and go live there? Okay, we actually don't know what the planets are made out of. And it will, uh, the other sad piece of news, <clears throat> you might think, well, let's just get a bigger telescope and look. It'll probably be a few decades before we can look. For some planets, James Webb Space Telescope will actually give us information on this. For a few planets, maybe 10. And that might be enough to learn a lot, I don't know. Um, but, but we're really, it's, we're, it's going to be a long time before we know what planets, before we know very specifically what planets are made out of. Um, you know, there, there's hope that we'll be able to figure things out before then, but, but maybe not, yeah? Yeah, so, so, so Pluto is in our solar system. It would fall off this plot because for some reason it doesn't go down to zero here. <laughs> um, so it would da be down here. Um, and um, we know its density pretty well. Um, and yeah, we, well, so the thing about Pluto, and this might be true for some of these planets too. We know Pluto does not have an atmosphere, a big atmosphere. You've got to be careful. Um, that's, you know, the laser jet service doesn't get to you. And um, actually, people usually, for some reason, I'm not even sure why, usually people s don't include iron when they're trying to figure out what Pluto is made out of. So people think it's just made out of just ice and rock. If you only have two components to work with, then actually, if you know the mass and radius, you can figure out what it is made out of. It's when you get up to four possible components that then you don't know the combination that will work. And so we think Pluto is about half ice and half rock. I don't know why iron isn't in the equation, frankly. It's, it's uh, because it could be there. Um, and so, but we, we do not, so if, if you add in iron, then we really don't know what Pluto's made of. We, it, took, it took until just a few years ago before we knew what Mercury's uh, composition was, how big its core was, uh, and, uh, and things like that. So, so we're, still, we're still just learning these things. What you want is to put seismometers on these planets. Um, good luck with that. Uh, that might take a while, because uh, then you can really probe the inside. Actually, there are ways of learning about the inside, and I, I have a paper on that, but um, it's, it's going to be a few decades, probably, before we have specific information on the insides of any one particular planet. All right. <coughs> So now I want to understand these planetary systems and what they're like. If I go to a typical planetary system, one of these dips, what is it like? And to do this, I'm going to take the system and understand what, and use this geometry to our advantage, as I mentioned before. The fact that some planets might be transiting, some planets might not be, and, 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 to, and to try to understand the architecture of these systems. And by using the massive amount of data that we have from the Kepler mission, we can study the multiplicity, which means how many planets there are, how they're spaced apart, what their relative tilts are, whether the orbits are circular or more oval shaped, and so forth. And when we do this, this is, uh, oh, and then we, what we do is we use this geometry aspect of, uh, I don't have time to explain it all, but basically there are some, uh, some observers that would see only one planet transit, some that would see only the other planet transit, and some that would see both planets transit. And the relative areas of these regions tell you how lucky you were to see all the planets transit. And then you can use that backwards to say, well, I probably am only lucky every once in a while, and so you can figure out how many planets there are. I can talk more about that later at the end. So here, so these, this is what these new planetary systems are like. Um, and these are, again, these tightly packed uh, systems. First of all, we think that there are probably three to five planets sort of in this, in this range uh, per system. Before the others are so small, you can't detect them yet. 
either they're too so small that we can't detect them, or they're just tilted just out of the way so we can't see them. Yeah. So probably all of these systems. And they were tilted. You'd see effects on the other orbits. Yes, sometimes. Uh, the, the effects are really weak, and we have to be really careful. That's a very tricky thing to do, but it is possible. It has been done, actually, a couple times. And so we're, we're working on that. Uh, that's, that's still early on. But yes, that's, that's exactly right. And that's something I'm, my research uh, gets into. Most of these planets have sizes about one to a few Earth radii. And really interesting, um, I thought, when we first started finding these systems, I thought for sure it would be small planet, medium planet, big planet. Small planet, medium planet, big planet. It turns out, mostly, it's... Medium, medium, medium. Small, small, small. Big, big, big. They're, they tend to be the same size. Uh, and it's really, really, I mean, certainly we see some systems where it goes small, medium, big. I just showed you one, KY500. But you, we have some planetary systems where the radius of the planets is 2.4, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4. .4. Not what I expected. Very interesting. Uh, the, most of these planets have orbital periods around 10 or 20 days. And uh, most of them are pretty close together. If the period of one is 10 days, then the next one is probably somewhere between 15 and 30 days. Um, and then there's a dynamical spacing criterion that basically tells us that they're, they're tightly packed, but they're not like on the verge of, of being so close that they all fall apart. They're just, they're just you know, stable, but not super stable, but, but interestingly tightly packed. Um, I won't go into this. And uh, the research that I've done on figuring out, well, how tilted are they? It turns out these systems have tilts between the planetary orbits of one to two degrees. They're not perfectly lined up. They're not, they're not very cantilevered. They're almost perfect. Interestingly, this is the same inclination distribution in the solar system, one, one to two degrees. What is the resonance or lack of it due to stability? Uh, in these cases, not much, because all the planets are low mass. So, so for the most part, it doesn't, doesn't make a difference. That kind of statistic is, those kinds of statistics would be the kind you'd expect if planets had migrated inwards. Yeah, so, so one prominent theory is that you make these planets out in the outer part of the solar system where there's a lot of material, and then you bring them all in. And you bring them in maybe one at a time, or maybe you bring them all in together, and you kind of line them all up, and they all sort of stack together. Um, that is one of the theories. There are some issues with that theory. Um, no, no, we're, we're seeing them. These are long-term stable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dynamically long-term stable. Um, there, so there, and there's some question of whether do you make the planet completely and then bring it in? Or do you make rocks, big rocks, and then you bring the rocks in and then you build the planets inside? Or maybe you just have so much, you know, maybe we just have been thinking about it wrong. Because, well, I'll get to the bottom here. <clears throat> Tens of percent of stars have these kinds of systems. Half, let's say, of stars have a STIP, not a solar system. That means our entire centuries of planet formation theory said, well, let's start with the solar system. I know that pretty well. and go with that. That could have been the wrong assumption. The solar system could be an oddball. And really, oh, well, to start, to understand planet formation, first you start with STIPS, and then, and, then you, and then you understand how that works. We could literally take planet formation theory back to square one and start over again with these systems. And there are a few papers that are starting to think about this. And one is maybe, well, maybe we migrate them in. Um, and, and, they're, you know, they're, they're, and this is all just starting. Uh, you know, there are some hypotheses that already look pretty good. One of them is this migration hypothesis. Um, but it's very early in the game, so I, I'm, I'm not ready to call a winner uh, by any means. We're still just barely understanding the properties of these systems as they are. Um, we know some of these steps have, have, have hydrogen helium envelopes, which means they have gas, which means they had to be around during the disk. And that actually jives with the fact that they're coplanar, because the disk is what lines them all up. So, so, so that makes sense. Some planets, there are two planets that are really close together really, really close together, practically in the same place as far as, this, as far as formation is concerned. One has a density of eight times that of water, and the other has a density of 0.8 times that of water. Their densities are different by a factor of 10. And when the whole possible range of densities is only 20, you know, there's, there's not a lot of range, and they almost fill that range. These are right next to each other. It's not like, oh, this one got a lot of water and rock, and this one didn't, or something. No, no. 
They are right next to each other. They, had this, they formed in the same environment, practically. And yet they, they have densities that are different by a factor of 10, a huge difference. Um, very interesting uh, data. And very, and very, very common. They, this may be the dominant mode of planet formation. And it wasn't really announced that way, and so most people don't realize that Kepler has opened up, and, and, and other data now have really, have really made this clear. There is an entirely new type of planetary system, and it's not like the solar system. These are completely different from the solar system. Um, so in the future, some of the work that I'm hoping to do is to really expand the studies that I'm doing of these systems to understand a lot more about the properties of the system, to understand more about what the underlying population is. Because remember, we only see some of the planets transiting. So the planets that I don't see transiting, I have to infer that they're there through statistical arguments. And that's, and that's trickier. And so to do that, I need to, I want to keep track of the, how long the transits are and where they are and how many planets there are per star and so on. And so this is something that I'm working on. And we want to motivate and test planet formation theories and understand the frequency uh, of, these, of these systems. This is what I'll be doing here. And I've been funded by NASA. So I mentioned, uh, I had to throw in several slides. I only got a few minutes, so I'll go quickly, of stuff that's happened just in the last month of you know, really exciting uh, research results just in the last month. So one is that um, here's the, the frequency of planets as a function of size. And as of a few months ago, we knew about this huge upswing. Whoa, it's going to get gigantic. A f about a month ago, a few papers came out saying it actually levels off. And once you get down to about two and a half Earth radii, there's as many one Earth radii planets as there are two and a half Earth radii planets. There's something really important about planet formation theory in here. It only came out a few weeks ago, so I don't know what it is. <laughs> Nobody knows what it is yet. Uh, so, so, but it's a very interesting observational result. Now, the next thing I want to mention is that these tightly packed inner planets are perfect for finding potentially habitable planets around a certain kind of star that's dimmer, called an M star. M star is smaller and dimmer. And so I want a planet that would have liquid water on its surface if I'm this close to the star, that star can't be as hot as our sun or else the water will boil off. So there's a certain kind of star called an M star where these dips, this most common formation mode, are, are habitable zone planets. And let me go right to the punchline. If you take, some people have started to do calculations of how frequent these are and are finding that on average there's about one planet, the right size and the right distance per M star. This doesn't mean that every, every one of these systems has one planet. It could be that there are one third of these stars each have three planets in this regime. We don't know that yet. That's what some of my research is going to try to get at. Um, but on average, there's about one per star. That means that we have this very big number. Because M stars are the most common star in the galaxy. In fact, practically, by number, practically all the stars in the galaxy are M stars. All 100 billion, all few hundred billion of them. If all of them have on average one potentially habitable planet, we are talking about 10 billion or 100 billion, tens of billions of potentially habitable planets in terms of size and where they are from their star. There are many other things that you need. <laughs> but, these, but these have the, f the, the two things that we can measure, how big are you and how far away from your star are you. In those two respects, these, these tens of billions of planets meet those criteria. There are many, many other things you need, I agree. So th I'm not saying this is how many aliens there are. Right? <laughs> this, this, is, this is the first step in that chain. Um, and galaxies, are, are these, you know, you could think of them as cities of, you know, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of stars. Well, this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is, they took a region of the sky where they couldn't see anything and spent uh, several days on Hubble trying to see it. Every single smudge in this image is a galaxy. There's a couple of, of stars here with the little, the little spikes on them. There are known about 100 billion galaxies. So you put these two numbers together, and we're talking, and there's re reasonable reasons to believe that this number, in terms of the number of potentially habitable planets, is not 
totally crazy. Maybe I'm off by a couple of zeros. whoop de doo right? It's a ginormous number, okay? If, this, if it's 10 to the 20th instead of 10 to the 22, I don't think anyone's gonna really make a big difference in terms of thinking about the cosmology of it, right? And what I want you to do is I want you to take this and have it reflect on your own life. And there's this principle called the Copernican principle. And it started with Copernicus saying, hey, you know what, maybe we're not the center of the solar system. Maybe we're not the center of the galaxy. Maybe we're not the center of the universe. And now we know we're just in a typical galaxy, a typical spiral arm, regular old star. Here's Saturn, beautiful, awesome, this little tiny speck. That's everything that has ever happened in the entire history of humanity happened on that little speck. That's the Earth, um, in case I wasn't clear. Um, and there are probably 10 to the 20th of those specs in the universe. We even now have specific examples. This is from this week. Kepler announced planets the size a little bit bigger than Venus at about the same distance from its star in terms of, in terms of how hot it is. Here's my favorite, Kepler 62. Five planet system. This planet here, 1.4 times the size of Earth's. Nice warm temperature, maybe a little bit chilly. Montana, Minnesota, like. <laughs> but in, so this is the, oh, sorry, this is the solar system. 62F is up here. We now have specific examples of planets basically just like our planets around stars just like our star. This just happened in the last week. This is the completion of the Copernican revolution. We know we are not the only planet in the universe with these properties. Here are some other ones. Now, there are many other properties you probably need for life, um, but, but, these, but these are some of the, the things. I, I think I'm going to conclude there because I'm out of time, and I think that's a good place to end. Uh, so thank you very much. I hope I'll take some questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agassiz. We have time for a few questions. So uh, I just want to talk about the not the most common exoplanets, but uh, the larger ones where you get to Jupiter-sized ones. Okay. Um, at one, I know there's more and more coming out of larger and larger exoplanets found. At what point do you switch and start saying, hey, that might be a brown dwarf? Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, brown, smaller brown dwarfs are being found too. So yeah. Yeah. Great question. So yeah, so we're interested in very small plants, but very big plants are also interesting. It turns out once you get up to about the size of Jupiter, if you dump a whole bunch more stuff on there, it, it, it is compressible and so it compresses down so it stays the same size. So you don't actually grow in size, it turns out. And so there is a, a number called 13, when you get up to 13 Jupiter masses, the pressure in the center gets so big that the, you can have some form of nuclear fusion, self-sustained nuclear fusion. So that's where we usually draw the line. Um, we have found that brown dwarfs are not common. They're quite rare. And one reason might be that they're just, if, if, at least in the sort of, <clears throat> they're rare in the regime of like this in planetary systems in the same types of orbits and things. And that might just be a function of when there was a protoplanetary disk, there wasn't enough stuff there to make something as heavy as a brown dwarf. We have seen some transiting brown dwarfs. There are some known ones. And uh, actually, really interestingly, very recently, a pair of white dwarfs was found, a white, uh, white dwarf, brown dwarf binary, very close to the Earth, um, and uh, is now a very exciting uh, object to look at and study. So I don't know if that fully answered the question, hopefully. Uh, great question. So uh, even the biggest moons in the solar system are much smaller than the Earth. So you may remember that plot that I showed of where we're really, so this regime where we're finding big-ish planets still a little bit bigger than Earth, um, these are still really hard for us to find, Earth-sized planets. We have just a couple months ago, <clears throat> we announced probably what one of the smallest planets, if not the smallest planet Kepler will ever find a moon-sized planet. It's not a moon, it's a planet as big as the Earth's moon, one quarter the size of the Earth, just tiny, way smaller than Mercury. That is still bigger than the biggest, oh no, I guess there are some uh, moons that, that big in the solar system. 
They're, so they're really hard to find on their own. They could, you imagine, wobble the planet around, and you could see that in terms of, oh, it's a little bit early, a little bit late. And there's a team at the Center for Astrophysics that has, that has set this as their goal to find these. And they are very good. Um, and so far, they've not found anything. Nothing in the light curves, nothing in terms of seeing the, the masses move around. Uh, and, they're, and they're doing such a good job that even if they find nothing, they will know what they would have missed and they'll be able to say. I suspect that unless these moons form in a very different way than the moons in the solar system, you, we don't actually expect to see anything because they're just, just too small. Finding Earth-sized planets is hard enough. Finding sub-Earth-sized moons uh, is, is, is also very tricky, really difficult. <laughs> Good question. At the time, it was a planet because um, it was launched in, what was that, 2000 and, golly. So it's, it's getting there in July 2015, July 28th, 2015 is the Pluto encounter. It's not landing on Pluto. That's actually really hard, just whoosh, flying by. Um, you would have needed to take the jo biggest rocket that we have and put about 100 more of those together to put something that you could land on Pluto. It's going to get pictures... Even, even in January of 2015, when it's still really far out, it will get pictures better than any other picture we've ever seen of Pluto. And it'll get really close. It'll get close enough, you'll get pictures that you could start to count the craters. You can start to look at Charon and see how big it is. We could actually see how big Pluto is. We don't know its size um, very precisely. Uh, Pluto now has Pluto, its big moon, Charon, which has been known for a couple decades, and now four additional little moons. We know very little about them. We don't know their sizes or anything. New Horizons is going to take pictures of all of those. Um, and so, so it, has, it has science objectives uh, that, that, are, that are based on understanding um, that the entire outer part of the solar system, the whole Kuiper Belt. We know very little about it. And every time we go and take a picture of the first comet or the first asteroid or whatever, get up close and see, we learn an enormous amount of information. So that, that's the idea. We don't know what we'll see yet. That's, that's why it's science. We, we don't know yet. One more question. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so those planets are so big that they block out about 1% of the starlight. And that's something you can do with the telescope we have upstairs. Okay. Um, and so, so well, not, uh, not this building. Though. Yeah, okay. same idea. But there are also other, other methods. There's one called the Doppler technique, the wobble method, that also is very good at detecting hot Jupiters. Uh -huh. And so, so both of those methods were really good. Hot Jupiter is the easiest thing to find with both of those methods. And so they were very successful very quickly. It turns out hot Jupiters are actually pretty rare as far as star stars go. Maybe 1% of stars have hot Jupiter, maybe less. And, and about how many do you think we're missing that are going this way? Um, oh, uh, so about one per, you could think, of the, I think the way to think of it is 1% of stars about have hot Jupiters. Tens of percent of stars, maybe 50%, have these steps. So these, these are by far more common than those. But as far, those as, far as the actual plants that we can't identify, these with Kepler, that their orbit is this way, not straight on, is there a percentage that you're looking at how many of those? So we see 63 hot Jupiters with Kepler, and you expect to see about 10% of them. So of the Kepler stars that we're observing, probably hundreds uh, of more of Jupiters that, that we can't see. Um, uh, directly, yeah, that way. Okay, let's uh, thank Dr. Ragazine again. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.